Hi everyone, welcome back to the garden. Yes, my garden, here in sunny North Lincolnshire. Today is a beautiful September day and I wanted to share with you our jungle garden here. This year has been a bit different. If you might have seen my last fire pit video, you'll know why. Last year we welcomed our first daughter to the world. So this year has understandably been very busy and the garden, I won't use the word neglected, but I've definitely been very efficient about the time I spent maintaining it. Luckily, for that one reason only, it's actually been a cool, wet summer, so a lot of these plants have really looked after themselves. So why would you want to watch this video? Well, if you're new to growing these kinds of amazing tropical or exotic plants, then hopefully this video will show you what an exotic jungle garden looks like after just three years. We moved here in 2020, the garden is almost exactly three years old, so you'll see just how established off these amazing plants already look. And if you've been following my videos for quite some time, then I hope this video will be the update you want to see this year. I've not been able to film many videos looking around my own garden, and it's been a bit of a battle trying to get it ready, get some filming time sorted, but today I've made it happen, and I'm really excited to share it with you. This year has been a tricky one, following a very cold winter with two week-long freezes, minus sevens, ice days, it was definitely a tough and challenging winter for a lot of these exotic plants. And then this summer has been cool, grey, wet. So not a great mix for us humans, not a great mix potentially for these plants. So in today's video, I want to share with you that plants have grown really well this year. Some have grown a little bit too well. And I want to share with you the casualties as always, this isn't a glamorous video showing a perfect summer display. This is about the realities of growing these exotic plants in the UK climate. The challenges, the opportunities, successes and failures all in equal measure. And I also want to share with you why I might have gone a little bit too far with my filler plants in the first year. So let's get started. You're joining me today then on a stunning September day. Blue skies, 25, 26 degrees, it really is amazing. So great to have summer here, even if it's a little bit late. And I wanted to start today's tour looking at this board here. Because it's a usual place I start, and also because behind me, it's a bit of a builder site. So we'll say it's for consistency reasons. Here you can see the lush tropical border. Very small, only about a metre and a half by about a metre and a half. And I planted this up for a video in spring 2021. The idea was using a mixture of tough and hardy plants to create a tropical look without any kind of winter concerns. And as you can see in the middle, that Trachycarpus waggy or Wagnerianus palm, it's growing all right. It's not growing as fast as some others have in the garden. And that's because next to it, around there, I had two small Fatsia japonica plants, which in retrospect were probably the wrong plants for that place because they'd either need chopping back as they grew up, or if I let them grow, they'd actually take some of the energy, the water, the nutrients from the wacky palm. So earlier this summer, I took them out and I've replaced them with this here, a begonia grandis, I think that's Sapporo that one, a beautiful lush begonia that's hardy and that comes back even after cold freezing weather. I think that fits in perfectly. And to tie in with that, I've got the other heuchras at the front there. And then I made one other change. I put in that Coniogram emiensis fern at the back, a beautiful lush exotic fern, potentially not the cold hardiest fern you can get, and also maybe a magnet for slugs, but I'll give it a go because it just looks so amazing with the ivy covered fence there and this persicaria at the back. So that's a small tropical border. I think for what it's worth, it's looking better than ever. It's really enjoyed this rainy, cool summer. But let's look at some of the other plants. Going forwards then, you can't help but notice this amazing bamboo. This is Berinda papyrifera. And I've got to say, it's probably the fastest growing plant I've got here this year. Just look at the height of these new culms. It really is amazing. They're huge now, probably pushing five meters tall. And this is a plant that went in as a small division back in, I think it was August, 2020. It's one of the first plants to go in. It really has done so well. At the front there, we've got the raspberry that I left in because we enjoy eating raspberries, not because it's tropical. It definitely earns its place here. And at the back, a tetrapanax, which I feared that I'd lost, but it's actually come back surprisingly well. So that one there is still sizing up, but I'm pretty sure it'll be a magnificent centerpiece there in no time at all. 
As we head further around, you'll see this young Dixonia Antarctica tree fern definitely will have preferred this cooler, wetter summer over last year's scorching temperatures. And another plant that will enjoy these cooler conditions is this Trachycarpus. This one's a princeps hybrid. It hasn't grown quite as well as one you'll see a little bit further on in the garden. That one really is a stunner, but still a great evergreen exotic that seems tough and hardy here in North Lincolnshire. On the note of hardiness though, let's look at this section here because there's probably a lot of stories to tell. And at the minute, it does look a complete mess. So firstly, we've got the Musabaju banana. That was completely cut to the ground. Two weeks of freezing temperatures, it was just too much for it, even with fleece. Cut right back to the ground. And this summer, it's not really been hot enough. This wasn't a large plant to start with. So recovery, the comeback has definitely been slow. It's still around four and a half foot tall though. It's a nice plant, but nowhere near as impressive as it possibly could have been. But there is a banana at the back here, which to me looks even more incredible. This is Musa Tibet, a very rare banana. I actually got gifted it as a present and it really does look stunning. When the sun shines through those leaves, probably not those two leaves there, they're a little bit browned I think, but when the new leaves have the sun behind them, they're an amazing vibrant lime green color. It really is an absolute stunner. And next to it, if you can see in there, it's actually produced a pup. So I'll be taking that pup in to the polytunnel as an insurance plant this winter to make sure that even if this main stem, the shooter stem gets damaged, I've still got another plant to continue with. But this one, I will be wrapping it, I'll be putting canes around it, packing it with straw, like you traditionally look after Musabaju to keep it safe from any freezing temperatures. In the front, you'll see a forest of tetrapanags. This one, I believe is a Rex, but feel free to, well, disagree or agree in the comments. I actually had a small trunk around two foot tall that was cut back and because of that it started popping everywhere. You've got the main sort of stem there, we've got another one there popping up in the middle of the bananas. They've actually managed to outcompete the weeds which really is saying something. You'll see a lot of weeds in this video. Overall then the, the look of this border is definitely a bit of a mess but I just put the insetti in there to add a bit more colour and leaves. I've actually lost a couple of plants in this area so at the back there I had a Scheffler Taiwaniana, but a bit of an unusual form, which obviously proved to be nowhere near as tough as the main Taiwaniana plant to grow elsewhere in the garden. And here I had probably one of my saddest losses this winter, my Sathia medullaris black tree fern. I wrapped it the best I could, but let's face it, a plant that can take dips to minus three or so, it was never going to enjoy two full freezing weeks, temperatures touching minus seven, ice days, it was simply too much without heated protection. So lesson learned there, unless you can really protect those plants, they're probably not the best choices for evergreen impact or any kind of impact year after year. So at the minute it's a bit of a mess, but I can see the way it's going. And as soon as autumn comes and I take in some of the tender plants like the banana there, I will be digging up some of these spare tetrapanaks, potting them up and moving them to elsewhere in the garden or moving them onto new gardens in spring. Over this side here, I've got a bit of a pot display. These are plants that will grow in the ground one day, but they're currently residing in pots. We've got some real beauties here. So at the front, we've got my favorite ginger, Hedicium gardnerianum. Because of the cool summer, it's only just coming into flower now. But when it does, there's one just popping through over there. I don't know if you can see it, probably not. When it does, it's got an incredible scent. It really fills the garden. It's an amazing plant. At the back there, we've got probably the biggest canna, canna musifolia. And behind that, we've got a giant miscanthus grass. That is the biggest miscanthus I'm aware of that you can grow in places like the UK. It really is a monster. I had it in the ground for a few years. It does spread. I dug it up to move it. So these are just small divisions, but even those are four meters tall and it can potentially get to seven meters, but more on that in another video. As we head through then, it's a mixture of successes, some plants that are really settling in nicely, and others which have moved slowly. This is an alocasia, and unfortunately it's not really grown this summer, mainly because it's been a little bit too cool. Most alocasia come from genuinely tropical areas, they need a lot of temperature to really get them growing, and I think this summer it's grown one leaf. Had it been warmer, and also with some real humidity and thunderstorms, it would have been rapid, but not this year. It's definitely not grown at all. 
The tree ferns though, like I've said, they really will have preferred these conditions. The fronds look greener and healthier than last year, and they've taken a lot less water to keep them looking good and healthy, which is definitely a theme of this year. Watering hasn't really been required, only for pots and around the gunnery that we'll come to very soon. Down here, another potential failure. This is a small Dixonia Antarctica tree fern. You know, there's ones you can buy at normal garden centers that are around 25, 30 pounds. That's what this was. But unlike the big trunks, which have actually bounced back despite losing all the fronds in the freezes, this little one has really struggled. And you can probably see in there, there's the faintest, faintest sign of life just at the base there that's slowly extended out. But to be honest with you, I don't have much hope for the plant. I hope it comes back, but if it doesn't, I've got plenty of other plants that can take that place and definitely lesson learned. But here, the big tree ferns, they've come back in a glorious way. And I really am so pleased. They're probably my favorite exotic garden plant. They just look beautiful. Like now, with that sunlight shimmering through the leaves there, they really do look spectacular. In this part of the garden, it's all about the tree ferns. That one there has grown incredibly well. It's just a one foot trunk, or it was when I planted it. Probably the best growing tree fern that I've got here in the garden. Is it a coincidence that it happens to be the most sheltered tree fern just nestled in, in this damp corner next to the brick shed? Potentially not, but it really is a stunner. Just backing up a second, this Fatsia polycarpa needham's form, it actually looks a bit weird this year. The new growth has been deformed, potentially by insect damage when the leaves were new and small, but let me know in the comments below if this has happened to your Fatsia this year. Around the base there, I've got different kind of grasses, a kind of clover macro there, looking fantastic. Sedges, ferns, Mahonia soft caress, they've all done really well. But as we push through what I call Tree Fern Avenue, we start to enter the jungle part of the garden. Looking down here, the ferns have done really well. Some of them just needed a bit of a tidy up, take some of those old fronds off. Generally speaking, they really have thrived in the cooler, wetter weather this year. They look fantastic. And further down here, there was actually a Shudapanax trifoliatus. That unfortunately succumbed to the cold. But as we enter through here, you'll see it's not all bad news. And a lot of these jungle plants really have grown well, especially in this area here. When I talked about the Trachycarpus princeps hybrid, this is the one I was referring to. We will be looking at some even rarer palms further down the garden very soon and a bit of updated progress on the fire pit area for you fans of this channel. But this palm, it really is one of my favorites. I planted it in the ground at our old house. I bought it back in 2017, small plant in around a 10 litre pot. It was in the ground for a couple of years and I transplanted it and brought it to this house. I dug up as much roots as I can and it's actually grown really well. Looking down there, You'll see it's got a good sized trunk in it now, pushing up through the canopy there. And these leaves, they really are incredible. It's still got that striking blue silver hue to the base of them. It really looks amazing on a winter's day with frost. It looks absolutely incredible with the sunlight just filtering through the leaves. And in just two or three years, maybe, it'll be high above this tree fern canopy. The whole garden will start to make a bit more sense here. The tree ferns forming this layer in the canopy and then the trek cap is pushing through them, but it really has grown well. Looking around here then, this is the jungle clearing. The sun's bright at the minute, shining through. I filmed this video a little bit earlier than I usually would. Some colocasia there that I never really got a chance to plant out. So they've been sat in a tray of water, which usually is a great recipe for massive leaves, but this summer there simply hasn't been the heat. So we'll focus more on some of the plants that are in the ground. This is the area of planting that I carried out this spring. Don't know if you remember, but essentially this was a narrow border. I chopped the concrete base back to give me a little bit more width. In it, I've installed two of these Phyllosakis Vivax Huanguensu Inversa Bamboo, which are a massive yellow and green striped beauty. A bit of a mouthful, but well worth growing. Now, admittedly, this space isn't the biggest for them for a big tin bamboo, so they're never gonna reach their full potential here. But they've gone in the ground for now, and I grew this in seti here in the middle of them to provide a bit of color and fill this border out this year. But as we look around, you'll see a border that needs no filling out. 
This border here contains some more tree ferns. And then we've got a newly planted Trachycarpus, again, Princeps hybrid there. I planted that one to mirror the one just across here. And I think they'll make a fantastic pair of gatekeepers either side of this entrance into the garden. And at the back there, we've got another one of those Barinda papyrifera blue bamboos. Again, it's grown so well. Those steely blue culms now, at the minute, they're definitely wrapped up in the culm sheaves that give papyrifera its name. You can hear those on a day with a slight breeze at today, just rustling in the wind. It really is an unusual sound, but it adds to the whole ambience of the garden. There's Remy there, don't know what he's up to. Remy. And then at the base of these, we've got a young Camrops palm there. At the back, you'll see my strip trunk Trachycarpus, which unfortunately isn't getting probably the sunlight or love it deserves. But you'll see there, it's still got that striking strip trunk. And I will continue this a little bit more. And in fact, you can probably see there, I stripped the trunk last spring. So that is about a year and a half's growth there, which is about a foot and a half. So it definitely ties in with the idea that an established Trachycarpus grows on average about a foot of trunk a year. And at the back there, you'll see the magnificent Virginia Creeper. That one is Parthenocissus henryana, the silver leaf one. It's definitely not as vigorous, but as you can see, it's plenty vigorous enough and it will need an annual tidy up to stop it going too far into next door. But that aside, well worth growing. You can see the flowers forming now, but it's mainly for the leaves that I grow it. But as we pan around then, it's gotta be about the tree ferns in this area. But the other key plant, it definitely, it's the bamboos. So here we've got a bamboo that I honestly think is underrated. This, I believe it was a Barinda at one point, but it's now a Fagesia and it's Angustissima. It's been in the ground from a very small plant. It's sized up well. Where possible, I always recommend growing bamboo from small plants. They just settle in so much quicker than a big division will, and you eventually get those big culms so much quicker. But this is a bamboo I'm not growing for the huge culms. This is a bamboo that's just attractive for its form, its shape, and the color, the size of these leaves. They're so delicate, very graceful, and this is a bamboo that doesn't take up a huge amount of space. So maybe a good candidate for smaller gardens, smaller borders, or potentially even growing in pots. It really is a beauty. It's doubled in size every year, and I think it'll create a magnificent sort of backdrop to all of the summer planting in front of it. But before I delve in on that, I want to show you this bamboo up here. This magnificent bamboo is Barinda lushuiensis, I hope I pronounced that right, or Yunnan 4. This is a bamboo that despite its unusual name, it's a bit rare, but it's well worth getting hold of. Now in winter, it's not the hardiest bamboo. And the past couple of winters where temperatures have gone to minus six or seven, the foliage hasn't looked good. Unlike the Vivax, the Fagesia, Robusta Campbell, this one definitely browns a fair bit, but in spring, it's bounced back both times. I'm not sure how cold it'll actually take, but just look at the height of it. It's without a doubt the tallest blue bamboo I've got in the garden. I'd say, without even exaggerating, we're looking at probably six, maybe even pushing six and a half meters tall. It really is a monster. And to give you an idea of the coloring of it, I'll just push past this Xantodicia Hercules hopefully you can see in there you've got this beautiful sort of silvery bloom to the culms then you've got the greens the blues it really is quite a magnificent bamboo not as tough as some of the others that i grow here but well worth it in my opinion and it's definitely sizing up incredibly well a true beauty then but as we head back into the jungle clearing area i'll first show you this area here before i move on to the elephant in the room <laughs> This area here then is a small area of summer tropical bedding. We've got an Alocasia brisbaniensis at the front there, an Nancetti that hasn't done very well. And as you can see, some of the new growth is deformed. And this is something that I should have spotted earlier in the summer, and I might have to actually act in it now, although it's a little bit late to get any meaningful growth out of it this year. 
And Seti can struggle from what's known as the strangles, where I don't know the exact cause of it, but essentially the new growth, whether it's caused by some sort of fungal infection or insects, becomes deformed. It pushes through and eventually the leaves get smaller and smaller as this main growing point is blocked up. And the answer to this, the only way of sorting it that I've found, is to simply chop the whole shooter stem and any effective leaves right back. So I'll probably cut this one to maybe just around there, chop all that growth off, and then I've found that new healthy rollers push through. So it's not the end of the world, but something I should have spotted earlier this summer. The Alocasia brisbaniensis below it though, they definitely look glossy and healthy. Although that being said, again, they've not really grown this year because a lot of these tropical plants just need so much heat to really get them going. You need to remember that a lot of these genuinely tropical plants, whilst we can grow them outside here in the UK during the summer months, a lot of them come from countries where the nighttime temperatures are 30 degrees. We only touch on that maybe once or twice in a warm year. Last year potentially was an exception, but either way, we don't have the consistent heat they need to really get growing. And this year, they barely started. That said though, Begonia luxuriance there, that really looks nice. A bit of insect damage, but I love the leaves. Almost like a Scheffler, but with even more color. Really is incredible. At the back there, you'll see Trachycarpus nova. That is a palm that grows rapidly. Probably the fastest Trachycarpus you can grow. That, I've actually grown it from a really young plant. It was the nicest looking one out of a group, and it's settled in really well here. Pushing out these long fronds. But I've got to say, these fronds or leaves, whatever you call them, they really are elongated on Nova, which means it's more susceptible to wind damage. So it's definitely a palm for a more sheltered position from those cold, strong or drying winds. Here under this tree, it's grown really nicely, but it's definitely got a more relaxed look to it. But anyway, talk no more. Let's move on to the Gunra. We've definitely got a Gunra problem here this year. I know you should never complain about plants that have grown too well, but in a year when other plants like this in Seti have really struggled to put on any meaningful size, this one's so much smaller than it probably was even at midsummer last year. This Gunra has really gone crazy, full crazy. It's massive. I mean, it's hard to actually convey it in a video, but that leaf there, if I put my phone on the middle, that probably shows you how big it is. The leaf is maybe seven, eight foot across, and that's not the biggest one. Over here, some of these leaves under the base there, that one is colossal. This one is massive. Unfortunately, as a whole, this gunner has probably grown far too well for this spot. This is something that I hinted at last year. I've actually got three gunner plants here. One was an original division that I split up just before we moved in. It's spring 2020. These were one medium plant and two relatively small ones. Now they are monsters. And as a result, they've actually grown over my path, which is a terrible shame because it takes a lot of effort now to get barrows around this plant. What I might do this next year is actually remove the two gunner on the outside. I realize you can't really see in the video there. You can't even see there because there's massive leaves in the way. <laughs> If I bring in here, you can probably get a better idea. So here in the undergrowth, this is one of the smaller divisions that I took. As you can see, quite a large crown. There's a miniature dachshund at the back there for scale. Still got those magnificent flowers on it, but that over there, that is the central plant. I mean, just look at the size of it, it's colossal. The leaves, even though they're wilted a little bit after a hot day like today, they're just massive, reaching up, at the back there, an eight foot tree fern, which is almost hidden by them. Remy's sniffing around, although to him it probably looks like some sort of alien beast, I know it does me. But what I might have to do is take out this plant here. I'm not fully decided yet, and I might think of a way I can get the actual leaves to grow more upright rather than outwards. I did promise Alice that they'll grow more upwards this year, but unfortunately it's been the wettest summer and instead they've grown really well. But it seems a shame to have plants like that tree fern there, all the hostas at the back. I've got a Scheffler Rhododendra folio at the back, which is definitely the toughest Scheffler that I've got here. I want to see more of them. So I might take the decision to remove this one and the one at the far end. That still doesn't remove the problem of that middle gunner absolutely dwarfing everything around it. It's a colossal beast and it just takes up so much space. It's got a wingspan now with definitely over six, maybe seven plus meters wide, an absolute monster. But I've got an idea, I'll show you what I'm thinking. 
what I might do, just bring you around a bit more, is to extend the height of this wall around here. Put some more stones in place and hopefully persuade the plant to grow more upright. I have seen someone who built a, like an actual sort of frame around the gunnera, sort of leading it up, trying to encourage it to grow upwards. So that's maybe something I'll dabble with this next year. But if it's a hot summer, unfortunately, it causes the leaves to relax like this. and It just takes up so much more room. So we'll see, maybe some sort of inventive tying up. I definitely don't want to lose this plant from the garden and it looks so right here when it's grown well. But this year it just has gone a little bit too crazy. But really what a sight. This now is technically known, I believe, as Gunra cryptica. It's actually a hybrid between Gunra tinctoria and the genuine original manicata that was brought into the country. I've got to say though, whatever the name is, whatever it changes into, I love this plant. Potentially the hybridization might have led to these plants being bigger, tougher, more hardy, and faster growing than the original manicata. So I'll definitely take this, whatever it is. But Gunra talk aside, Let's show you some of this border here. At this side, you'll notice we've got Persicaria. This one is Red Dragon. Now, it's actually planted here as a filler plant. I had a few dahlias there, I think, maybe a couple of dahlias, and then one of the purple canners there. It's not made an appearance. It was just too cold for it. So this Persicaria has really worked hard. It's definitely earned its place in the garden, and it's such a great plant. You can grow something like this in your UK tropical or exotic garden, and it's just such a great gap filler. It gives the impression of a lush, dense sort of jungle, but you can easily chop it back. Just remove the ends of the stems, do whatever you want to do. You can chop it back twice, three times a year, and it will keep coming back. And I don't mean that in an invasive way, just in a really helpful way. This year, I've been able to let it spread, lean over a bit more gracefully because the other plants just haven't come up. In another year, it'll be maybe a tighter clump at the back of the border. Either way, it performs a great job here in the garden. The front there, I put this in this spring, Begonia grandis. This one, again, a tough, hardy begonia, and I think the leaves really work well here. That's probably the direction I'm going with this part of the garden. Leaning in more on the hardier exotics, plants that come back year after year. And rather than trying to pretend it receives full sun, this area is actually incredibly shaded. Got that big cherry tree there, which is actually struggling a bit. So this area here, it definitely doesn't receive enough sun to really get the canners either A, through winter, or B, performing to the best. So I might grow more of these ferns, the darker leaves, other plants like begonia, to really add a sort of lushness to this area, whatever the summer weather. But that being said, we'll probably have another ruthlessly hot summer next year, and I'll change my mind again, so we'll see. At the back there, you'll see Scheffler Taiwaniana. That one took a bit of damage this year. You can probably see where the growing point's been hacked back, but it sprouted off again. And instead of one growing point, we've now got three. So we'll get even more of these beautiful palmate leaves to decorate the canopy within future years. The Trachycarpus, they've grown well as always. This one especially has really settled in well. I've actually got five in a row, all planted at a similar size, but I've got to say, they're not consistent. This one has really grown head and shoulders above the rest. It just goes to show that there's definitely variability in plants. And just because yours isn't growing quite as quick as you hoped, there's definitely a reward in patience. It doesn't mean that you've done something wrong. Here though, is a canna that has come back this year. This is Canna Altensteinii, which I grew from seed and planted out in late spring, early summer 2021. Yes, it's got a bit of insect damage, but this is definitely the toughest, hardiest canna that I grow here. And it's in the wrong place, which is typical. It was a great filler plant, but now I'm at a point where this part of the garden doesn't really need the filler plants. So this winter or this autumn, I'm going to dig these cannas up move them to the polytunnel and then they can go somewhere else next year and it's also a great opportunity to split them next spring it looks great fantastic lush foliage a good bit of height and it's actually flowering too so it really is an amazing canner and it just shows out of all the plants i've got here in the garden out of all the money you could spend on expensive specimen plants the two plants with the most impact are this huge gunnera which i got as a small division as a gift from someone and these canners which are grew from seed. So it's not all about the big expensive plants. But as we push through, I'll crack on and show you more of the garden. 
more nasturtiums there, more caterpillars eating them, but I don't mind. Happy to just live and let it live. We've got another Rinsetti, which has grown all right, but nowhere near its potential. It usually grows so much better. But looking back, we've got a plant, Tetrapanax. You might have heard in a previous video, my trip to Linden Nurseries looking at tropical style plants. I looked at Tetrapanax. Yes, it's a fantastic plant. And I mentioned that I had one at the old house, which grew rapidly. Even though it didn't look like a Rex form, didn't have the same divided leaves, it grew incredibly well, quicker than some of my genuine Rexes. This is the plant. Planted out as a small plant in 2020. Unfortunately, as you can see this winter, it died right back. The trunk completely bare. I left it in all the way through, hoping that it was gonna bud up and start growing again from the actual stem or trunk itself, and it didn't. But what it did is send up a forest of these pups. They're everywhere. I've probably got about 10 to 15 in this area now. So yes, what you've heard about Tetrapanax, the Papyrifa form, yes, it's not as hardy, and B, it's more prone to pupping. Whereas the Rexes seem to come back more reliably from the actual stem or trunk themselves. Well, that's just my experience here anyway. But what I'm gonna do, not the end of the world, they're all in an area where I can remove them, is simply when it gets to late autumn and I'm digging the tender plants up anyway, is pot some leaves up and grow them on the polytunnel. But I've left it here. We'll say it's not down to laziness. It's more to show you this as an example of what Tetrapanax can do following a cold winter. Looking back, you'll see, again, there's plenty of beautiful, graceful plants under there. There's this lovely sort of leaning over tree fern that I'm recovering back to its best. There's all sorts in there. There's beautiful ferns around my small jungle pond, but you can't see any of them because of the state of this massive gunnera. I mean, just look at that leaf there. Behind it, we've got a Scheffler with a lovely fatsia japonica you probably can't even see there. There's another Berinda bamboo up there, but all you see is this colossal leaf. So I might <laughs> take out the two either side. We'll see. It's a tricky decision and I do love the gunnera, but equally, I do enjoy growing all the plants in this part of the garden as well. And to have room for three of these beasts really is a bit tricky, but let me know what you think in the comments section below. This part of the garden though, Again, the idea of filler plants really comes to play here. And the Persicaria, it's definitely done more than its fair share of the work. It really ties the whole garden together. So looking down here, we've got a shuttlecock fern or ostrich fern. As you can see there, that's actually producing quite unusual growth. Not seen that before. It really does look striking. And around here, we've got some formiums, which they definitely got hit hard by the winter. But all it's a case of is just when you get time, which is a crucial thing, just remove some of these damaged leaves like that and the plant will be as good as new. They generally are tough, really tough and hardy plants, resilient to most freezes, but they do take a bit of damage when it gets cold. Looking down here, we've got nasturtiums. Again, great filler plant, easy to push seeds in. Just buy a packet of seeds, it's two pounds something, you get 60 or 100 seeds and push a few in the ground at different places around your garden. So reliable, so colorful, so easy, they're great. Musa Baju, that's not done as well this year. You might have seen my post over on Instagram recently. This is a plant that I had high hopes for, but instead it's grown to, again, maybe about five foot tall. Not as big as it could have been, but I think the problem is that this was quite a young plant again, only two years old, so it didn't have that mature base. But at the base of it there, you'll see, if I can dig through the persicaria, there was a shooter stem right in the middle there, which is now a black rotten mass. And surrounding it are these other pups. So they have grown well considering it could have been game over for this plant. And it shows how, if you are prepared to be a bit patient, just how tough these musabas you are. Fingers crossed we get a mild winter this year and this really gets up to its sort of potential next year. It'd be nice to get it to maybe seven, eight foot or so and that way you can walk under it. But that's maybe just a bit optimistic anyway. At the back there, one of my huge eucalyptus trees. That one, Glaucessens gotega form, it really is a monster. Not quite as wide, apparently, as Gunnii, but it definitely grows tall. So that one is certainly <laughs> reaching for the sky. Not a tree that I would grow close to a house, but here, with a bit of room, hopefully it's got the space to really thrive. It might dry the soil out around this area, which is why, if you're wondering, I've got the Formium, I've gone for Euphorbias, I've gone for the, the Boutia Arius Pathophyme over there. 
I've gone for plants that can actually cope with dry conditions, even though this is the lusher, more jungly part of the garden. On this side over here, we've got Trachycarpus wagnerianus or waggy. I bought it with a one meter trunk. They're actually selling it as Fortunii, and I think it was around a hundred pounds. Whereas now you'd be lucky to get something like this for probably even double that. And here, I've tried to go really simple with the planting. The tree ferns all got hit hard by last winter, but now I'm pleased to say they've all bounced back. Some of the ones earlier only threw out one frond in spring, but with this summer being so wet and mild, they've kept throwing them out ever since, and they've come back to the former glory. Got Persicaria, purple fancy at the front there. Doesn't that look magnificent? Yes, it needs to be hacked back every couple of months, but I just love the patterning, the impact of it, and the way it just fills an area without any effort at all. That tree fern there in particular, massive fronds, really does look something. But again, next year, these canners won't be here. I don't need them as a filler plant now. And I think sometimes in this area here, less is certainly more. That is the Boutia Arius Patha or Arius Partha that I was talking about. It certainly got a little bit bitten by the frost last winter. You could probably see the browning there on some of the leaves. But as you will notice, that central one there, that's a new frond that's pushed through, that is untouched. So it shows really the hardness of these palms. Even here in rural North Lincolnshire, where we had freezing fog for days, ice days, minus seven that lingered around, it still survived with just fleece on top of it. So very tough palms, very resilient, even in less than optimal conditions, here in a shady rural part of the world. Got all kinds of Schefflera and younger plants growing there. Rather than having them on a seed tray close to the house, I thought I'd bring the pots up here and let them experience some full jungle conditions. A bit more shade, a bit more shelter, and a bit more humidity. But as we head through, this is where things go from we'll say potentially organized to being incredibly messy. There's mistakes up here, there's weeds, there's construction projects, there's everything. But seeing as it's a nice day, I'll take you around anyway. Besides, if you watch this much of the video, we might as well go all the way, haven't we? On this side here then, forget about every other plant in this area, the dahlias that I should have staked. In fact, I'll be chopping them off and bringing them inside as soon as I film this video. But I thought I'd leave them on to show you that I can grow pretty flowers as well just badly. <laughs> the main plant of this area here is all about the bamboos. And on this side here, we've got Phyllostachys vivax aureacolis, which is the beautiful golden bamboo. Yes, it's a runner. So this is a bamboo that I will be digging a barrier all around as soon as I've made my mind up about what I'm doing with this path. Because at the minute, it's all a work in progress. I'm pushing barrows over here, so you can see the membrane. It's a bit of a mess, but you'll just have to trust me, I've got a plan. <laughs> But look at this bamboo here, I think this is really interesting. Although Aureacolis is generally golden in colour, it does throw up green culms, or occasionally ones, like this one closer to me here, which is a mixture of green and the golden colour. But this year's biggest culm is without a doubt this striking green beauty. And it's hard to really convey the size of it, but let's just say, look up there. Probably again, six, seven metres tall, it really proves the whole third year leap saying. A lot of these plants, particularly those like these, which were hacked up divisions when we moved in, they take a year to really sort of settle in. But take another year to actually start pushing the roots down, building up that rhizome. And on the third year, that's when they leap. And this one has certainly leapt for the sky. So that one is a real beauty. A sun loving bamboo, low maintenance. This spring, what I did though, is to actually remove all of the leaves, all of the growth lower down. Basically the little branches like this. I remove them all from the lower third of the bamboo. And that way you can really appreciate the form of the plants themselves. You can see those striking golden canes. Some there that I need to do, now they started pushing through. But I think it really sets them off. And on this side, again, it's uh, use your imagination and definitely too many filler plants time. So this area in general, I'll backtrack a bit. This area is going to be a bamboo tunnel. There's a big phyllostachys on this side here, and then there's a blend of phagesias and berindas, other clumping bamboos on this side, where they get a bit more shade, essentially. This main plant here is phagesia robusta campbell. 
a really great bamboo for beginners. If you want a tough, hardy bamboo that does spread, it does get quite big, but it's not invasive, this is the one to grow. It's very tough, very tolerant of sun, wind. It looks green, immaculate in winter. It really is a great bamboo. And by clumper, yes, it still gets big, but as you can see down there, it does expand predictably. So next year's culms or canes are gonna grow around it there, immediately around this main clump. It's never gonna dart on the ground and just pop up five meters away. But potentially what I might do this next year is remove one of these clumps. Originally, I had five in here, and that was mainly to A, provide a bit of shelter to the tree ferns behind, and also B, <laughs> with having this channel, I wanted to get a lush evergreen backdrop as quick as I could. So if you're looking to create a quick screen, maybe cover something in your garden, you can put more plants in to start with, but be aware that you will have to remove them over time. So I might actually remove this one on the left here to really give the one in the middle there a chance to size up and it can potentially fill this area by itself. But at the minute, I'm enjoying this beautiful lush green evergreen backdrop. Got a couple more blue bamboos here. This one is actually Q Beauty, which really is a beauty. And I love the way, again, it's got these graceful small leaves. It's a great contrast to the big file stack is behind me. On the way up, we've got more of these Canna Alton Steinii. These will be coming out this autumn. Again, there were filler plants I grew here to pad the garden out, ready for Gardener's World to come in. But now they're not really required and I can grow them elsewhere. Looking through, that one there is another CS 1046 Berinda Papyrifera, and it's grown quite well this year, pushing through the canopy now. And at the back, you can maybe see this, another blue bamboo. That one is a KR7613, I believe the number is, a Keith Rushford collection. Another striking and really cold hardy blue bamboo. So you can sort of see what I'm working towards, but at the minute, there's a lot of canopies in the way. On this side here, We've got a number of self-sown Verbena banariensis, a euphorbia there which has just popped up, and this is the green vivax. A bit rarer than Aureocolis, this one really does grow well here in the UK. And if you want the cold hardy bamboo that gets big culms, you won't go wrong with a vivax, whichever one you go for. Those are more Canna altensteinii. As you can see, in the year when a lot of plants have really struggled to thrive, for me, this Canna has really proven itself as being a strong, robust grower, a hardy, tough plant, and also a beautiful plant that's not afraid to flower before autumn, which is always good to see. Got a Miscanthus giganteus there, grown nicely, but this one will be moved again at some point. I don't like to say that every plant in the garden is getting moved, but this time it's because of a major construction project. Now, I don't know if you saw my recent fire pit video. In that video, I talked all about this area here. As we're heading up to this end of the garden here, Remy leads in the way, this is a sunny, exposed end of the garden. During winter, there's definitely more frost at this end of the garden, and particularly right at the far end there, when we had those mists and fogs during that cold spell, it was all around that bottom end. So it's exposed, but it's full sun. So the planting style definitely changes here to a more Mediterranean exotic look. Now, just ignore the weeds, ignore all those blocks. Those were a temporary solution to making this area look good. But this year, this spring, I've dug all this out. I'm gonna have hard landscaping running all the way through here to tie the whole garden together. So it's definitely a long-term plan, but check out my other fire pit video for more information on it. But today, I just want to give you a quick walk around and show you some of these incredible Mediterranean style, tough, hardy, exotic plants. So here, this is the big Jabea chilensis. It's been in the ground three years now and it's really sizing up nicely. I love these palms, probably my favorite cold hardy palm. Just so angular, so beautiful, a striking beast. They're definitely a slow grower, but well worth the wait. When they do get big, they get massive, monstrous. Check out my video at Vent and Botanic Gardens if you want to see what these really look like when they get going. They look incredible. But those were 40 years old, admittedly, so I don't know how big or how long I'll get to see this one in the ground, but I'm excited to see just how big it gets. There, we've got a load of bees on the Hylotelephium. Those, again, we're putting as a filler plant, but now they're not really required. They've got a bit too big for the space. So that is definitely the theme of this video, as it probably was last year's video. I just didn't get time to take them out. The filler plants are great for getting a packed, lush look quickly, but they definitely outgrow the space, and they will at some point need moving, 
the perk of that is you get to split them up and get even more free plants for your garden. That Boutia odorata there, although I lost one at the far end of the garden, this one is sheltered very nicely by that conifer behind it from next door there, which happens to be positioned at the north of it. So it really does show you size is important for palms. This one's a bit bigger, so therefore tougher, able to withstand longer freezes, but also microclimates are everything. We're definitely not in a sheltered garden here. We're in an exposed edge of a valley in North Lincolnshire, but just having that conifer there, pushing over the top of this palm, I didn't even fleece it this last winter. And as you can see there, the new growth really is pristine. So that honestly shows a tough palm is only tough if the place it's in is suitable, appropriate, and has a good little microclimate. That trachycarpus there, was the first strip trunk one that I planted out. And again, you can see how much it's grown. It needs a bit more taking off. But last year, it really struggled. It was just too dry for it. Because it's raised up on a bank here in this Mediterranean section, it really struggled to grow well. But this year, with the extra water, now the roots are deeper, it's pushing out some lush, healthy green growth, which is great to see. And just in case you're wondering, there is a rhizome barrier between this section and that section to stop the bamboo getting further this way. A new Darcy Lyrian that's gone in this year. I just think they're incredible plants. I mean, can you imagine that lit up either by the setting evening sun or maybe some kind of lighting? I mean, just look at it. And that's a plant, isn't that incredible? Just look at it. The back there, we've got the Trachycarpus, a trio of young plants that I planted out. I think if you can grow Trachycarpus from a young plant, they get so much bigger, so much quicker. They actually can catch up and beat a larger plant that's gone into the ground. Check out my video, looking at Mark's crazy tiki garden for more examples of that. But these ones in particular have really settled in well. They're really starting to take off now. And just look at some of the leaves. That one there is nearly a 360 leaf, which is quite unusual, but potentially a really stunning form. And at the base there, you'll start to see some more euphorbias that are self-seeded. What they actually do in the hot summer days is the flowers pop or the seed heads pop. They fire the seeds out. They just jet them off everywhere. So they start to appear in places like the boots of that jubeta there. So potentially weeding or potentially an opportunity to pot up some more exotic plants. More hylotelephiums, which are absolutely buzzing with bees. Again, if you saw my Instagram story recently, I put up a post showing these absolutely covered with bees on a day like today. They really are stunning. And if you're not already following me on Instagram, I'm at George's Jungle Garden. Follow me over there for more pictures, little stories and clips from the garden when I don't have time to do a full video. Another massive jubea there. Here, we've got Euphorbia John Phillips, which really is an evergreen tough beauty. At the back there, we've got Pinus patula, Mexican weeping pine. It really is a stunning pine tree. And I know I did mention this in my last video, looking around the fire pit. A lot of people don't think that conifers are exotic, but to me, they do grow in natural environments with a lot of these palms. And I think visually they pair really well with some of these feather palms. But what I will do with this one is just remove this branch here to let a bit more sun through to my precious Jubea number two there. And what this will also do is provide a lot of evergreen overhead cover to some more tender plants that will be going in this bait sunny border here. But looking back, you see now as the sun's starting to go down, when I actually get some hard landscaping going all the way through there, it really will look stunning. And I know this is probably just in my head and I'm asking a big favor of you to really see what this might look like one day. But the crucial thing to me is that I've got the main structural plants established in the ground. These are the plants that have all settled in for the past couple of years and will continue to settle in. You can't cheat time. <laughs> These plants take a while to grow, particularly the jubea. So anytime I've got them in the ground, it's time they're spent getting more and more awesome. The hard landscaping, you can soon do with a bit of effort or a lot of money or time none of which I've really got a lot of at the minute, but trust me, it will come together. So here, this is the fire pit area. If you want to see more about this and really my struggles to create something, definitely check out my last video when I tell you more about the story behind it. But today I want to share with you where it's at today. Filmed a couple of weeks after my last video, I've actually made some progress that I want to show you. And it's also a more beautiful evening to really share some of these gorgeous exotic plants. 
Here is an aloe polyphyla or polyphyla. I grew that myself from seed, just living there at the minute, loving life. It took a bit of winter damage this year, but it's grown back really well. And all I did for that one this winter is simply put it under a table, under a glass table in the garden, and it's done all right. So the plan here, if you don't watch my other Fire Pit series, is I'm going to have two cobbled walls, one either side there, to create a sort of Cornish effect. When you go to those gardens like Treba, Heligan, you see these walls with succulents or the plants growing out of them, that's what I'm going for there. But over here, I've got my sun-loving, beautiful palms. This one is a Jubutia, which is a hybrid between Jubea and Butia but potentially, or definitely faster growing, and maybe hardier than both. It really is amazing. No winter protection this last winter, and no damage at all. And in fact, the damage you can see there is only sort of residual damage from the original Spanish or French grown fronds before it came over here. At the back there, we've got a Camrops Volcano. That one really is striking. I got a chance of that one at a great price before prices went a little bit silly with these kinds of plants so I had to have it and at the back to complete this sort of trio we've got Camrops humilis serifera which is a really blue silver form just wait till I show you it from the other way all kinds of yuccas and sedums there but check out my fire pit video series to hear more about those that is probably the rarest palm in my garden this is a butiagris and this one in particular is a cross between the toughest cold hardy bootier that you can grow and potentially the toughest hardiest cygrus. So really what I'm saying is this is a coconut style palm, like a genuinely tropical looking palm with the potential to be cold tolerant for us UK palm growers. Is it tough enough to survive in North Lincolnshire? Well, I've given it the best spot I can and I'm prepared if I have to, to build a little enclosure around it. We will see. But hopefully here, in this raised bank, it will really thrive. And in front of it, we've got an agavia vatifolia. We've got a couple of small Camrops humilis serifera. They'll stay quite low. That booty agris will grow, hopefully, right up above them. And at this end here, we've got a princeps there. The true princeps with the gorgeous silver blue leaves. And we've got a few hybrids here. So in between the beautiful soft flowing nasella or steeper tenuous grasses, we've got these really structural trachycarpus princeps crossed with waggies. These will hopefully be really gorgeous stiff leaf palms that will absolutely thrive in these slightly dry conditions and look great with the more relaxed planting over here behind them. Pushing through, well, let's just say, I wish I could have shown you this on my last fire pit video. Just look at some of these. I bought these from a stall outside the road. I think the Delasperma, Ice Daisies, but if you know better, then you can certainly correct me. <laughs> I just love these. For a bit of summer interest, I don't think they're hardy. I just think they look beautiful. Not really my colors. I tend to go for the more bold, bright colors. Those pinks are definitely a bit out there, but they've really done the job this year. In between some of these really amazing yuccas, I've got some beautiful yuccas here, like Linearis or Linearifolia. And then I've got some potentially really scary yuccas. This one is a hybrid between Linearis galliana and then Triculiana, which potentially could be a monster tree yucca. There, we've got Philifera australis, again, a real beastie. But to balance out those bold structural forms, we've got a sea of California poppies. And how good do those look? This is what I really wanted to share. And, and I'll jump up in here to show you in my last video. When the sun's shining on those, how amazing do they look? Yes, they're potentially growing a bit too well and distract from the yucca restrators behind. Next year, I won't have quite as many of them, but I will let them self-seed. Because for a pack of seeds, I actually got given a couple of little plants. I don't get given loads of plants, but I just wanted to mention it. Just look how much color and joy they bring. They really are amazing flowers. And at this area of the garden, I definitely am not afraid of a few self-seeding plants. And I think really that is the key to soften the overall look. The whole theme for this area is desert arid style planting, but I didn't want the garden that's completely sparse or too modern looking. So just ignore the weeds. Again, that's a common catchphrase at the minute in my videos, but hopefully you can see what I'm going for. With a few striking, carefully selected palms, those amazing Yucca Rostrata and Thomsoniana, a few agaves thrown in, and then loads of sedums and other drought tolerant plants. I think the look of this will be really impressive when they settle in. 
The sedums are great for the insects as well. So it's not a garden that's purely aesthetic. I like the idea that it's almost more natural in a sense. There's a lot more movement than you might expect and a lot more stuff for pollinators as well. But I'll just head through to show you this far in the garden and complete today's tour. This will eventually be a proper patio area. The walls will be clad, there'll be benches all around it, and then some kind of fire bowl, some kind of centerpiece in the middle there. But that is yet to be decided. But as we head through, these are supposed to look shambolic and very homemade, so the garden gets certainly a little bit rougher as we head towards this end, both in terms of the construction and the weeds as well. We've got an aloe there, Darcy Lyrian, Nifophias there. And again, the idea is to really sort of have plants that emulate the desert look, despite not being genuinely sort of desert plants. Plants that can really thrive in these hot, dry conditions. And this is a part of the garden, once it's settled in, I won't be watering it. And if you look up there, you'll see my big eucalyptus trees. These will absolutely suck the moisture out of this part of the garden. But rather than seeing that as a negative, for these plants, really, it will just help them. It'll help them in winter, it'll help dry the soil out. There's three eucalyptus there, which I did talk about in more detail in my fire pit video, but I'll nip around this side and show you a bit more. This is a border that I actually completed just this weekend. When I say completed, I mean, I've, I've done it to a certain point. There's still some rocks and smaller plants to go in. I've gone for a tree here with Rostrata. One of my favorite yuccas, these are incredibly tough and hardy, and they're just look beautiful with the sun behind them as well. So in this area here, I think they really will look fantastic paired with a bottle brush over there and backed by my existing Cordine Australis. That one in particular, I noticed the other day, it started really sprouting from lower down the trunk. So potentially it could look incredible following last winter. These are the big eucalyptus. At the back there, we've got a Glaucessens Gotega. That one is absolutely racing for the sky. At the far side, we've got Neglecta, which you grow for these colossal leaves. Just look at the size of them beautiful sort of glossy leaves absolutely amazing and on the right side here we've got a slightly smaller eucalyptus this one only grows to if i said probably seven to ten meters max it will take a while to get there quite quick initially but it does slow down and you might think eucalyptus quite an unusual plant but to me as a tree choice for this end of the garden where it's full sun where i really want the exotic look it's important to have evergreens that really lean into that aesthetic Yes, they have got flowers for the pollinators. You can probably see in there, there's some small flowers. So they're not completely devoid of any value for the planet, but I just love the look of them. They grow quickly, so you get to see a tree achieve maturity, a ridiculous size in your lifetime. I love the look of them, the fact that they will be more open lower down as they quickly size up, and also the scent. Eucalyptus on a sunny day like today, the scent coming off of them really is amazing. It definitely creates a whole different atmosphere at this end of the garden. And as much as I can do these long rambling videos talking about the garden, to actually be here, it's a part of the garden where I want it to be about the sensations. I want it to be about the exotic look, yes, but it's also about the dappled light as it shines through the leaves of these plants. It just looks amazing. Whether that's a spring day, a winter day, an autumn day, a summer day, any time of the year, it looks incredible. You've then got that scent as well. It really just transports you to another place. I absolutely love them here, and I hope they'll continue to grow really well. And lastly, I'll just share with you this part of the garden here. You would have thought I would have learned from my filler plant mistake, but no. <laughs> Again, more of these California poppies there that I probably didn't need to put in, and I will take these out before winter. Because if there's one thing these beautiful yuccas need, it's good airflow in winter to really be as tough and as hard as they should be. We've actually got the grasses here from New Zealand, quite brown grasses, which I want really to help set off the blues that are in the yuccas. We then got the red hot pokers to keep the sort of vibrant, strong, hot colour thing really running through the garden. And then to cap it all off, that magnificent olive tree there. Very tough, very hardy, and unquestionably exotic. Doesn't look incredible? Amazing. So I hope you've enjoyed seeing this look around the garden. And that glimpse of the sun there, that really shows you what it's about. Today's video has been more about the plants, my mistakes, my plans, and asking a lot of you to really look past the weeds, the carnage, and, well, definitely a fair few mistakes. But this is really what the garden is aiming towards. Have an area here at the far end in the sun. After you push through the dense jungle part of the garden, being able to sit out here, 
and see that low summer sun or autumn sun shining through those beautiful evergreen leaves, smelling the scent of the eucalyptus, enjoying the sound of all the pollinators on the sedums, the California poppies, seeing those sculptural yuccas dancing in the beautiful evening sun, oh, that is what it's all about. And I hope you've enjoyed today's walk around. So thank you very much if you've stuck with this video. I appreciate you all. And I'll see you all very soon. See you later.